Thanks for coming. I know most of you, so this is going to be easy, <laughs> easier than I thought. But uh, I'm going to read. Um, I, I just did a reading in, in Portland, and I, I read the one part of the book that mentioned a band that was um, from Portland. <laughs> and that went over. Well, actually, that didn't go over at all. So, <laughs> but uh, but it is a New York book. Um, but but I I kind of thought it was important to include a, a period. It's also a '90s book, and I thought it was important to include a period uh, when I was here about twenty years ago. Um, in 1993, 1994, I think I left. I left shortly after the quake, the Northridge quake. Um, and the OJ, something happened with OJ, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so this was a period when I, I moved here and I felt like it would be, e even after being a failed poet and a failed novelist, I felt like it would be really easy to be a successful screenwriter mm. for some reason. Um, and that it was like a gold rush and all you had to do was show up and, and have um, an attitude and, and ideas and, and maybe a, l a, little, a little bit of talent, not nearly as much as I thought I had. And, uh, and I would just make millions and millions of dollars. And this is sort of, this first bit I'm going to read is a little interlude about how, uh, what happened when that attitude clashed with reality. <laughs> um, and uh, I had a writing partner at the time, a sc screenwriting partner who went to Bennington with me and his name was Justin. So when I refer to some people who aren't um, uh, Whoopi Goldberg or Mickey Rourke or people that you know, I'll probably stop and, and, and put them into context. Uh, Justin was a lot more together than I was. I, I had a, a drug problem, Justin didn't. Um, and I had lots of um, self-esteem issues and Justin didn't, didn't seem to have them. And, and so we were, we were a weird, a weird uh, uh, mix, but his connections and, and his sort of charm got us into uh, into these meetings, and then my uh, just perverse self sabotaging, self medicating <laughs> um, uh, behavior got us kicked out of these meetings. So, <laughs> stop smoking pot before these things, Justin warned. Also, that's my pot. Come on, it went fine. They said they loved us. It's me. They say that to everyone. You really don't understand how this works, do you? I really didn't. When we win our Oscar, you can wear whatever you want to accept it. Until then, please just shave. It's true. Look at what some famous people wear today. Whoopi Goldberg, Mickey Rourke. You can be sure they didn't dress like that when they were young and hungry and auditioning. The funky Agnes B sweater, the weed, the B.O. and the stubble, all that needed to go in storage until the contracts and the checks and the production started rolling in and out. I had it in me. I'd used restraint in my housewarming mix. Intellectually, it made sense. Nobody rebels when they first get meetings. They rebel only once they can. The writing was good, too. It deserved more sincerity than I was giving it. I would have had to discard poor Johnny from Naked, who was my role model at the time, to give you an idea of, of how twisted I was, um, if we were ever going to get anywhere. I don't know if you've, anyone has seen that movie, the Mike Lee movie, Naked, but it's, he's, he's like a total antisocial wreck. Um, I would have to truly become one of the crew so I could snobbishly, uh, so uh, the crew I so snobbishly held myself above because I'd read better books, or at least bought better books and had better records and lived in the Chelsea once. <laughs> Justin always drove to pitch meetings. We'd play Nirvana's In Utero and Justin would sing along to the most abrasive tracks in the sweetest voice like he was singing along to John Denver or Kenny Loggins. <laughs> I wish I could eat your cancer when you turn black, he'd croon, as if it were a love song, and I suppose it is. Uh, sometimes if I was glum, he'd cheer me up by singing certain K-Rock hits in the voice of our fellow Bennington alumna, Carol Channing. You haven't heard The Wrong Way by Sublime until you've heard Carol or Justin as Carol render it. I'm not even going to try and do it justice to it, but it, something like, uh, uh, never mind, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> the meetings went on and on and on and on. Everybody loved us. Nobody gave us money. Nobody gave us plans. We never knew what was next. 
we had the screenwriters blues like Soul Coughing and men built Paramount Studios and Columbia Studios and men in booths at those studios gave us tickets and directions and we tried not to get lost, but we really were lost when we rolled the fuck up. Jessica, our agent, would ring us after each meeting and give us the lowdown, but it never seemed to include anything concrete. Each meeting only ever led to more meetings, dozens of them. So many that Justin was given a leave from Castle Rock where he was working. Forget that he was the only one of us who was employed. Um, sometimes, oh, okay. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, if we could just hold out a few moments longer, the rewards would be great. It was worth eating 49 cent burritos from the Mayfair, standing in line with two of them while the carts before and behind you were loaded with organic groceries. Sometimes I'd steal a pint of liquor or a copy of Rolling Stone. Here I was on the list for entry at every studio in town, resorting to petty theft to get a little buzz or to read about the new John Spencer Blues Explosion album. Terminal Gossip, huh? That was the name of our script. Um, great title. Did you see Terminal Velocity? This is different. Good movie. Ours is good too. Buy it. As with Luce, my first still unpublished novel, all of my self-worth was tied up in how my writing was received. That's still the case, by the way. Um, that, acceptance, that acceptance was love to me. I was a nothing unless I made people raise their eyebrows and respond to the quality of whatever thoughts and ideas I was selling or trying to sell. I had to blow people's heads off with what was coming out of me, or I could see no reason not to stick needles full of cooked black Mexican tar into my right arm. In a way, it would have been more honest if I just kept a rolled up dish towel of needles and charred spoons in full view. Instead, I hit the bottle like a 60s housewife. I carried a half pint of vodka in my back pocket with my cigarettes and my two key chain, one for the house, one for the car, which had no gas in the tank. This was also a time, it, it felt like, um, in the 93, 94, it felt like uh, the indie film was, was just really sort of starting to, largely because of Quentin Tarantino, um, uh, become like a big deal and people were starting to, to buy scripts by people like us. So it, it didn't, it didn't feel like that much of a stretch to, um, to, uh, to have these dreams. And, and so this is, um, uh, so this is this, you know, I'm going to give you a sense of like David O. Russell had really spanking the monkey. Paul Thomas Anderson, cigarettes and coffee was circulating as a much bootleg video cassette. Todd Haynes, second feature safe was getting made. The aforementioned, I guess I mentioned it somewhere earlier, <laughs> Greg Araki was hooked up, so it was Party Girl, which would break Parker Posey through, and Todd Solon's Welcome to the Dollhouse. Kevin Smith was making Chasing Amy. His best film, hands down, although Dogma is a close second, in my opinion. Killer Films, Good Machine, these were some of the companies that our agent began talking about with regard to getting gossip made. It seemed entirely plausible that we could enter this world too, Justin and I, if we only had a little bit of luck and the right people behind us. Greg Araki's scripts were just as camp and crude as ours, and an even bigger wave was coming, one that would switch nearly every yellow-lit, talky indie film project to green. After Khan that spring, the floodgates opened and nobody, didn't, and nobody didn't know it. But Justin and I were aware of it way before that, that Pulp Fiction was going to be the biggest indie film ever made. I'd stayed up all night reading the Pulp Fiction script in the dark, illuminating the pages with a flashlight. It was long, full of scenes that didn't make the film, and read more like a novel than a screenplay. We would almost certainly get our deal once it hit. Every small nerd would. This was the Beatles in 1964, or Nirvana in 1991, and Justin and I were not too proud to be Jerry and the Pacemakers or Seven Mary Three. Uh, now, this is the single, I think, worst, I'm including this, this is the single, this was, this was the point where like all that hope that I just described went out the window. Uh, the more I hated these studio executives we were meeting weekly, the more I wanted them to love my writing. Even when these executives placed their feet on the coffee table, right on our script, and made us stare at the heels of their shoes, Justin kept a smile on his face. And who does that with the shoes anyway? Was that some kind of feral signal of dominance? Because it happened with more frequency than you would suspect. Welcome, I am the boss of you, smell my feet. <laughs> Then the meetings would end, and you would exit with your parking validation and your unopened bottle of Poland Spring, wondering what happened, which you would not know until you called your agent later in the day, and she'd say, oh, they loved you, they loved you, they loved the script, and then you'd never hear from them again. Not only did it make me dizzy, it made me ashamed that once I believed I would have the muscle to 
swim in such a current that I once believed I had the muscle to swim in such a current. Dustin could tell that I was already divesting, pining for New York, pining for the fjords. Do you have any other I, do you have any other ideas? One executive asked me as we were about to leave yet another fruitless sit down. Yeah, I have an idea. I finally said. Justin looked at me. We hadn't discussed any new ideas, any second acts or follow-ups. For a moment, his eyes pleaded, please don't, whatever it is, please do not. <laughs> it's about a poor family that adopts a cat that shits money. <laughs> now, this, this next bit is about when we finally do get a job and we get, we get money to, to write, uh, I think it's a, it was a pilot, and it was the first time... Um, that anyone ever gave me legal tender for something that I wrote. And it was about, uh, it was about, uh, it was a sort of a 90210-ish uh, teenage soap opera that uh, involved a bunch of um, Latino kids at uh, SeaWorld water park. <laughs> or it, was, it probably wasn't even SeaWorld. They probably called it like Ocean, Ocean Town or something. You know, it was, it was sort of not. <laughs> Ironically, I left Los Angeles more or less for good just as we finally started making money. If I'd been a little less proud and gutted it out, I'm sure Justin and I would have had a career there. We'd been introduced through Tracy Katsky, who was a Bennington friend of ours, um, to the producer Al Burton, who was an industry veteran who was, who'd had a hand in everything from the facts of life to Charles in charge. He'd hired us to write a treatment for the pilot of a Telemundo-style knockoff of Beverly Hills 90210, which I just explained, called Sueños de Fama or Dreams of Fame. The story took place at a SeaWorld-like water park and featured an orca that wasn't the famous Shamu. We wrote the script and almost perversely omitted the otter. You will not find one in our treatment, and that act of sedition might be the only reason I can still look myself in the mirror to this day. <laughs> to Justin's credit, he didn't push it. He knew it was ridiculous, too. Burton never mentioned it again. He paid us, pro that he was, on time and in full. When I cashed the check at the check cashing place on La Cienega, I took all the money and bought myself a rare steak at Musso and Frank's, the famous grill in Hollywood, then stopped into a travel agency in a mini mall off La Brea. <laughs> now this next last bit is about, uh, I'm already a writer at Spin. I'm getting, not, not necessarily as a, a living wage as some people here would attest, but um, Starting to get, you know, sort of vaguely exciting uh, assignments and, and getting to travel and, and, and this is, and getting uh, my first, where the hell is this, book deal to ironically write a book about um, Los Angeles. So I, um, I'm going uh, back to LA. Uh, this is around two, 2000, the year 2000, so about seven, six, seven years later. Uh, and, um, but I don't know anything about LA punk. I mean, this is like 70s style LA punk. You know, I mean, I, I was like uh, eight years old when, when, uh, when Brendan Mullen, the, the late Brendan Mullen, uh, who seemed like the king of LA to me, uh, opened a club called The Mask. Um, so I had my first book deal, the one I'd been chasing for probably since I was 18. And I was in, I was on a, a track. I knew I was like going to be a professional writer, but I had no idea how to write this book. And I, this was about me kind of um, partnering up with, with Brendan uh, with, with much difficulty. He was 20 years older than I was. He was there. I was not. I was sort of, I had to sort of pose, pose as, <laughs> as someone who, who had cred. But really, I was just sort of, um, I was just sort of living off Brendan's cred, and and Brendan uh, passed away uh, store about two years ago, and it's very strange on a personal note to be in Los Angeles without him. He always used to pick me up at the airport, and we'd go to Denny's. So this is the, the, uh, the the triumphant, semi-triumphant return to Los Angeles. Um, Typically, in 2000, I woke up in the morning and did my Roy Scheider routine with the Visine. Coming to after sleeping off a bender was always an oh no moment. You check the room to make sure you're alone and not naked next to someone else naked, someone frightening. <laughs> then it's, how's my head? Most of the time you knew when the hangover was going to be incapacitating. You felt the spike in your skull even before coming to. 
Other times it was a walking lethargy, a functional flu that could be minimized by a makeshift Russian bath in the tub, running a shower spray and inhaling the steam until the little yellow beads formed on the ceiling. Some Chinese hot and sour soup from Sammy's noodles or a line of blow, and I was back. It's showtime, folks. Uh, but it didn't end there. This was the era of drunk dialing via email. Then putting the world to right, the Who Must I Apologize Today review. Well, uh, I was, as I mentioned earlier, a cokey late night email score settler. The morning I remembered that I, uh, what I'd done and uh, that morning I remembered what I, I should say that I, uh, I wrote a piece for Spin on Guns and Roses. It was one of the first sort of like oral histories. Uh, there were magazines do them all the time now, but this was like um, kind of like a new thing. And Brennan was in it. Uh, talking about booking them into a club he used to book called Club Lingerie. I don't know if anyone remembers Club Lingerie. Um, and Brennan he felt like I misquoted him or quoted him out of context. And he wrote a, a really angry letter letter to the editor at Spin. And it was the only one, like Axel Rose didn't even, wasn't even as upset as Brendan. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I wrote him back in, in one of my drunken like stupors. And, and then of course, was terrified that I'd actually done that, but he was, uh, he was on, uh, and, and I'll, oh, so, 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 so anyway, this is, this is one of the, one of the few, you know, um, one of the, one of the many, uh, drunk dialing email incidents was happened to be to Brendan Mullen, who I was terrified of. He had a reputation as a cantankerous dude. Um, okay. That morning I remembered I, uh, what I'd done and rushed to my computer to see if I couldn't unsend the email. Brendan had an AOL address, and at the time you could unsend mail that had not yet been opened by the recipient. Sure enough, there was a reply from Mad Scott 21 at AOL in my inbox. Not only had the fucker opened my invitation, which was to invite him to, um, to work with me on this book because I was lost, and he was, you know, he was there. He was like the mayor of LA Punk, but he'd written back quickly. And what, and, was he interested? Of course not at, uh, as some quote unquote bullshit paid consultant. No, Brendan wanted in 50-50. He wanted to write this thing with me. Jim, who was my agent, Jim Fitzgerald, uh, of course hated the idea. Who the fuck's Brendan Mullen? Brendan's an LA punk. The guy opened the mask. What the fuck's the mask? <laughs> Jim's like a New York guy, you know. Jim, as any good agent would, was protecting me from myself, but I was already convinced that this was the only way quote unquote, untitled LA punk book project was going to get done right. I told him the only alternative was to give the money back and squelch the deal. So he initiated negotiations with Brendan and I waited as sparks flew. As was his habit, Jim CC'd me on every email and it was like being a kid in the middle of warring divorcees all over again. Neither wanted to give an inch. The letters were especially ferocious for some reason, as if they'd come from warring clans who'd have been spitting and slugging it out for centuries. But still, listen here, Irish pig. Just try and write this book without me. See how well you do. No one's going to talk to your boy. I don't respond to this. Click. Only now there was no going back. I told Jim, ordered him, really, to stop negotiating. Offer him half. But you don't even know what, what he's half. <laughs> but that still wasn't the last of it. Brendan didn't want, to, didn't want to pay any expenses and didn't want to split the cost of the photographs, which the author always has to pay for, and for which, in addition to taxes and commissions, takes a serious piece out of what initially seems like a large advance. Not that I'd even gotten a large advance. Fuck it. Let him have everything he wants, I shrugged. But please, everything. Once the negotiations were done before Christmas, to the Christmas 2000 holidays, Brendan's entire demeanor changed. He suggested I come out to Los Angeles immediately. I, I don't really have a place to stay, I protested. I'd already spent like money half of the advance. Keith Morris from the Circle Jerk said I could sleep on his cot. <laughs> I thought that it would impress him. It was true. I talked briefly with Morris, who was the original vocalist in Black Flag. Uh, is that true? He was, right? Okay. Uh, before leaving to found Circle Jerks and growing enormous dreadlocks. Like a lot of punks who'd, whom you'd assume would be snarky and mean, Keith was sweet, smart, and nothing like his punk rock image. Marilyn Manson is the same when you meet him in person. Most of the supposed boogeymen are. 
Still, it just felt weird. There was no context. And where was the cot? In the living room? In his room? Did Keith Morris snore? I know I did when I slept. I always felt like writers should write in hotels when away from home. They should write in rooms that looked like hotel rooms when at home. But there was no money for any of that. This would be rough travel, hard trotting in unfamiliar territory. Even with Brendan Mullen as the punk rock Sherpa, I had no illusions it wouldn't be a cakewalk. It would be a cakewalk. You can stay here. There's an extra room, Brendan offered in his stuffy voice. Serious? It's in the office. You can sleep in the office, Mark. Oh, okay, thank you. At least I knew where the bed would be. And Brendan and I, if nothing else, had a context. I was going through a period where I didn't want to fly. I'm not sure why. I just felt something dark when it came to flying in 2000. Don't get on airplanes, man. That self-preservation voice, all too faint in my life, constantly whispered to me. Sometimes I'm fine flying. Other times I feel incredible dread and foreboding, and you can't drag me to a terminal. This was one of those times. I spent the last half of my initial advance on a sleeper cabin aboard the Super Chief, and Brendan agreed to pick me up at Union Station. I spent much of the three-day trip in the smoking car underneath the train or eating cheap ham and cheese sandwiches and drinking whiskey and Cokes in the dining car. I had nobody to talk to, so I eavesdropped on conversations until it seemed like I wasn't traveling alone. I'd write down things I'd overheard. I don't need a woman to give me pain, one old black dude said. I can do it myself with a bottle of Jack Daniels. Only takes me two days to recover instead of three years. I raised my jack and toasted him, but he'd never know it. I knew the train was nearing LA and I began to pace. I was still terrified of meeting Brendan Mullen. Even on the phone, he sounded imperious with his still pronounced accent. He called punk punk. <laughs> the man waiting for me though at Union Station on that too sunny morning was nothing like the photos I'd seen of the, or the images I'd concocted. Here was a schlumpy, soft-spoken, absent-minded, middle-aged man with a shaved head full of silvering stubble covered with a cloth fishing hat. Like my father, he'd reached the age where being a dandy in an iridescent jacket with zebra fur lapels, as he was wearing in another vintage photo I'd seen of him, just wasn't worth it anymore. He wore a clean navy polo shirt and chino pants and seemed cheerfully stoned, almost like a hippie. Is that Mark? He asked. Hi, Brendan. I offered my hand and we shook it. And we shook. All right, Mark. Glad you made it. He did seem genuinely happy now that we'd gotten the business out of the way. I looked at his face, trying to make out the young, angry punk who'd once inhabited it. There were patches of stubble and patches of clean-shaven skin, as if he'd gotten lost in thought mid-razor stroke and never returned to the task. <laughs> we got into his beat-up car, and he spent five minutes trying to get the station to come on. Someone had bent the antenna in half. We drove to the nondescript suburban block in West LA where he was living with his pal Jim, a strange tall man who worked a day job. It was strange that he still had a roommate at 51. I began to understand just why he was taking such a hard tact with my agent. Brenda didn't have much for all his legend. His archives were collected in boxes lined up for uh, around a long wooden kitchen table. His records were in storage. His ride was a beat or two in a city where a man's wheels mean everything. His glory days as a club promoter, performer, and DJ at Club Lingerie in the 80s and the Viper Room in the 90s were long over. As I put my suitcase down in the ante room where I would end up sleeping for the next month and a half, I realized that if Brennan were going to help me with my first act, I was going to help him with his second. He'd been waiting for me too. We needed each other. From that point, I began to love the guy, and I think he warmed to me fast. We ended up taking a long lunch at Denny's, which began a kind of tradition. Sometimes we go to Cantor's on Fairfax. I'd sit in the booth and Brennan would give me a history lesson about the dark side of LA. Manson, the Process Church, L. Ron Hubbard, The Hillside Strangler, The Murder of New Wave Theater host Peter Ivers. It was like meeting moon, it was like eating moon over my hammy with Kenneth Anger or James Elroy. <laughs> Brendan Awake and Baker was a terrifying driver. And that is something in a land where drunk drivers were divided into bad, conspicuous drunk drivers who got arrested and decent drunk drivers who got home to the Valley or Silver Lake. This was pre-GPS and Brendan's cannabis fuzz sense of direction was better in theory. Once we drove all the way to Pasadena to interview Peter Case from the Plimsolls and Dave Alvin without headlights, he'd forgotten to turn them on. Uh, Lucy's El Adobe, an old school, low-lit Mexican place near Brendan's house, was our command center when we had money. The Eagles used to eat here, he'd sneer. We needed Astro Burger and we had none, which was most of the time. We'd fuel up, go over our hit list, then spend the next 10 hours excavating the LA punk past. Another time, he'd staked out a junkie hangout looking for Rick Wilder of the Berlin Brats. 
Brendan could pass a house, couldn't pass a house without pointing out some grisly mishap that had taken place inside. Hello, Slovak overdose there. That's where Salminio was stabbed. Peter Ivers got his fucking head bashed in right there. Oh, and we have to write about Jane King. Jane King was an actress who used to hang out the mask, and one day she disappeared and they found her by an overpass. She'd been murdered, Mark, by the hillside strangler. I had to hire security at the mask. Can you imagine, Mark? Security at the mask. Imagine was all I could do. In the introduction to the LA punk book, which I lobbied to call We Got the Neutron Bomb after a weirdo song, Brendan always hated the title. I wrote self-consciously, one of us was there, the other spent the 70s watching the Muppets, but we shared a common goal to give Los Angeles punk rock the respect and consideration it's due. This isn't entirely true. The Muppets part, yes, but I was not evangelical about giving LA punk its fair shake. I just wanted an experience in a first book, which would lead hopefully to a second book. It's amazing that Bomb is as good as it is, regarded now as a classic in the rock and roll canon because it's such a clusterfuck of motives. Have you ever heard this? The Weasels, it's called Beater with a Rake. Brennan would chuckle as he pulled an old 45 from one of his dozens and dozens of crates. Oh, oh, and this one's great, The Rotters. Sit on my face, Stevie Nicks. <laughs> Years later, when he moved to a more spacious home in Silver Lake, he'd fill an entire garage with record shelves. I only knew the big guns of LA Punk. I never heard the screamers. They never recorded. The Alley Cats, the Eyes, the Controllers, Top Jimmy and the Rhythm Pigs, Black Randy and the Metro Squad. Before we wrote a word, I got the full-on crash course. When it was my turn to play a tune, I always went for Beauty and the Beat, <laughs> <laughs> particularly track five. This town is our town, Belinda Carlisle sang. This town is so glamorous that you'd live here if you could and be one of us. Brennan once let slip that he'd slept with one of the Go-Go's. As much as I begged, and I begged him constantly about this, he would never reveal which one. Something in him bristled each time I played Beauty and the Beat, though. I figured if I'd spun it enough, the town would become my town again. But in Brendan's eyes, I was always the New Yorker. When we fought, we fought like sports fans. Brendan was not anti-New York, but he was certainly committed to ripping down the NYC exceptionalism with regard to popular culture and certainly punk. The Ramones got a pass. <laughs> Legs McNeil is a provincial cunt. When Brendan said cunt, it came out cunt. There were punks in LA long before there were punks in New York City, Mark. Believe it. Frank Zappa, Phil Spector, Charlie Manson, Jim Morrison. You know who was in the crowd when the Doors came to play in Detroit, Mark? Iggy Pop. Look it up at Jim Morrison like a fucking hero. He wiped his nose and tried to calm himself down. <laughs> Thank you. I can take any questions if anyone has any questions, but I kind of read kind of long, so.